So the Colorado River is, uh, it's a remarkable river. Uh, it's the major source of water in the southwestern part of the US. By international standards, it's not a very big river. Uh, it's, a, it's a fraction of the flow of the Mississippi. It's a fraction of the flow of the Columbia River, but it's so important because it is really the only major river in that hot, arid part of the, of the country. Uh, it probably serves 40 or more million people. Uh, it provides water for irrigation in the Southwest for agriculture. Uh, it's shared by seven states in the US and it's also shared by Mexico. We have a treaty that the US signed with Mexico many, many years ago, 1944, that allocates the waters between the US and, and Mexico. And we have internal agreements that allocate the water here among the seven states in the US that share it. Uh, and it, you know, it formed the Grand Canyon. It's a, it's sort of an, it's an iconic American river. The water originates in the Rocky Mountains as snow in the winter. Uh, it, it, storms bring water to the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and Utah and, and uh, the upper basin states. And, uh, and it runs off and it runs off in a lot of different smaller rivers that flow into what ultimately is the Colorado River. Uh, it flows south through the seven states and then across the border into Mexico, and it empties out in the delta in Mexico and the Gulf of California. So, so John Wesley Powell was a, so an amazing man. He was a, a one-armed Civil War veteran, uh, an explorer. He ultimately became head of the U.S. Geological Survey at the end of the 1800s. He was the, the first white man to lead an expedition down what was previously an unknown, uncharted part of the Western US, down the Colorado River. He, he built boat, wooden boats, wooden dories, and he put together an expedition. And they launched at the top of the, at, through the Colorado, at the top of the Grand Canyon, having no idea what was in front of them. And I think several months later, they appeared at the bottom. They, they actually navigated through the the Grand Canyon for the first time. And he, he was really a man who understood the way water worked in the West better than any other, any other white man bef before and after. Um, and Wallace Stegner describes uh, John Wesley Powell's history and biography in a wonderful book called Beyond the Hundredth Meridian uh, that that talks about that expedition, but also John Wesley Powell's entire career and his efforts to get the country to understand what the West was like and what water in the West was like. And one of the things that John Wesley Powell said, he, he in 1890, uh, 1893, he gave a talk in Los Angeles at the International Irrigation Congress. Uh, and he told the, the assembled audience there, quote, I tell you, gentlemen, you are piling up a heritage of conflict and litigation over water rights, for there is not sufficient water to supply the land." End of quote. Uh, he understood that there wasn't enough water, and yet we ignored his advice and we developed the West in a way that assumed it had unlimited water and that we could, could take everything that was there. One of the things that we've done in this country forever is we've assumed that we could develop anything we wanted anywhere we wanted in any form we wanted, and we would find the resources to satisfy it. We would find the energy, we would find the land, we would find the food, we would find the water, and we could build whatever we wanted. Uh, and that, that mentality really defined the US uh, in both a positive and a negative way over the last 200 plus years of our existence. And for water in particular, what it meant was we built big cities in the desert. We built massive, uh, massive industries in, the, in an area that didn't have much water with the assumption that we would find the water. We would bring the water there. We would, we would somehow develop the water resources and meet those demands. And we're now running up against the reality that as John Wesley Powell said, there is not sufficient water to supply the land. So one of the challenges we're dealing with today 
is that when the Colorado River was divvied up, when it was split among the seven states that share it and, and among Mexico, there was an assumption about how much water that river would reliably provide. And the assumption was based on a very short period of record in the late 1800s when you know we had rainfall records. And in 1922, the seven basin states signed what's called the Colorado River Compact, allocating the waters among the seven states. But the assumption was based on this old historical period of flow in the Colorado that has turned out to be an anomalously wet period. Uh, we allocated at the time 15 million acre feet uh, uh, among the seven states and another million and a half acre feet to Mexico. So 17, 16 and a half, 17 million acre feet in a river that we now understand only reliably provides 14 or 15 million acre feet. So right off the bat, we've given away more water than nature provides on a reliable basis. And, and in fact, that that problem is a characteristic of water problems in the Western US as a whole, not just the Colorado, but in California, for example, we've given away on paper five times more water rights than nature will ever reliably provide. So the idea that, that we could give away water that nature doesn't actually provide is, again, part of the problem we're facing today. And of course, now, the natural hydrologic cycle is being dramatically influenced by human caused climate change. Uh, those allocations were set in 1922, but they've been renegotiated, especially in the last few years, with the understanding that, in fact, there is a shortfall of water. Uh, and they haven't been renegotiated in a literal sense. They've been renegotiated in the sense that if there is a shortage, the states are discussing how to allocate that shortage who's going to get cut first, where the shortfalls will fall the hardest. Um, but within the allocations among the states, there's also allocations about who gets the water there. And that's a split between agricultural interests and urban interests, urban being residential use, use by humans in homes and industrial use and commercial use. In the Colorado, probably 75 or 80% of all of the water that humans use in the Colorado goes to agriculture. That's historically been true. It's true today. Uh, it's going to have to be addressed in the long run. And the rest of it goes to the cities, uh, Arizona, Arizona's Tucson and Phoenix and California's Los Angeles and Nevada's Las Vegas. The cities divvy up the rest of it. Again, I'm a, I'm a climate and water scientist. I've worked on water issues forever. And um, many, many years ago, uh, I did some of the earliest work on the way climate change, human-caused climate change, would affect water resources in the Western United States, in the Colorado, in the Nile, in Egypt, uh, and in Northern Africa. Uh, and in 1993, uh, with a colleague, I did a report on the way climate change might affect the Colorado River. Uh, again, in 1993, the science community was <laughs> understood that climate change was a real threat and was likely to become increasingly important. Now, of course, we know today the impacts are blindingly obvious, but even in 1993, there was a sense that climate change was going to be a risk, especially for water resources, um, among other things. And so we did this study for the US EPA, looking at how climate change would affect the Colorado River. Uh, and this is actually a paper copy of that report. And what we did was we um, took the output of large scale climate models that were trying to understand how growing concentrations of greenhouse gases would affect the climate. And we took the output of those models, tem in changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, and we used them to run the model of the Colorado River that the US Bureau of Reclamation uses to operate the system. It's a federal system because it crosses multiple state boundaries. It's run by the US Bureau of Reclamation as part of the, uh, part of the Department of the Interior. And even then in 1993, the results were that climate change would have dramatic impacts on the river. That even modest expected increases in temperature and decreases in precipitation would would lead 
if we didn't change the way we used water in the river, would lead to the reservoirs running dry, shortages of deliveries to users, loss of hydropower, increases in salinity in the river uh, as fresh water flows decrease, increases of threats to endangered species, the whole series of threats and problems that now, of course, we see today. What we're seeing today from climate change is first of all increases in temperature that's happening everywhere global warming the concept of global warming is part of climate change uh, temperatures are going up they're already way beyond anything humans have experienced for a long time and the trend continues to increase and higher temperatures alone means more evaporation more demand for water by soils and forests and agriculture uh, it means what falls as snow in our mountains melts earlier and runs off faster or never even melts, it just evaporates off the off the mountains. But in addition to changes in temperature that we're seeing, we're seeing changes in, in precipitation patterns. We're seeing less rainfall, less snow in the western US as a whole and in the Rocky Mountains that feeds the Colorado. And so that's sort of a bad combination, higher temperatures, changes in precipitation patterns. We're seeing a drop in water availability in the Colorado. Stream flows are dropping, water availability is dropping, reservoir levels are dropping, hydropower is dropping, all of the things that we projected might happen in the early 90s are now coming true. Another important characteristic of the Colorado River is that we've built massive dams on the system. We built the, the boulder now Hoover Dam that created Lake Lake Mead, uh, Glen Canyon Dam that created Lake Powell, uh, Flaming Gorge Dam. There, there are massive numbers of very large, some of the largest in the world, dams and reservoirs on the Colorado to store water so that we can use it during dry periods, store it during wet periods, to create big reservoirs for recreation, to create hydropower facilities for energy generation, those reservoirs are a critical part now of the Colorado River system. But as we've changed the flows, we're changing how much water is available overall, how much water we can store in those reservoirs, how much hydro generation those reservoirs can produce because less water means less hydropower. And we see today with the dropping water availability, dropping reservoir levels, and it's quite dramatic. I mean, it's. It's sort of stunning the images that we've seen out of both Lake Powell and and Lake Mead. Uh, you know, next year could be wet. We could have a we could have a return to a wetter period for a while, but unless we get water use under control, unless we start to limit how much water we're taking out of the system, I think it's unlikely that we're going to see any significant permanent increases in water levels in those big reservoirs. They're going to continue to be overdrafted. They're going to continue to, to be low. Uh, you know, I'd love to see a couple of years of incredibly high rainfall and runoff, and that's entirely possible. But in the long run, unless we change the way we manage the system, those reservoirs are going to be increasingly at risk. You know, the dams will be there for, I don't know, thousands of years, maybe. The, the, those big concrete plugs will will be there for a long time, but the reservoirs themselves are increasingly, the water in the reservoirs is increasingly vulnerable. What we do now partly depends on what we want to happen. And there, there are really just two sides to this. One is water supply and the other is water demand. Uh, how much supply we get is a function of how we screw up the environment and nature and what we continue to do or not do on climate change. Uh, so on the supply side, we have to stop emitting greenhouse gases. We have to slow the rate of climate change. We have to slow the rate at which we're disrupting nature and the hydrologic cycle in the hopes that that will slow the changes we're seeing in rising temperatures and changes in rainfall patterns in the Rocky Mountains and other places around the world. Uh, I mean, it's not just, this isn't just a Western US problem, it's a global problem. But on the other side of the equation, which we tend not to think about as much, is demand. How are we using the water that we get? We're clearly using too much water out of this, taking too much water out of the system. Uh, the more water we demand from the system in excess of what it can supply, the more we run a deficit. Look, 
uh, one of the things that I've worked on again for, for many, many years is the idea of water use efficiency and doing more with the water we're already using, growing more food with less water, with better irrigation systems uh, or different kinds of crop types, uh, doing better in our industries, using less water to produce the semiconductor chips and the beverages and the food that we that, that we process in our factories or the clothes that we make. Um, doing better in our homes, using more efficient washing machines and dishwashers, uh, more efficient toilets and shower heads. All of those things can let us do the things we want with less water, which is my definition of efficiency. And speaking of lawns, we could get rid of lawns in the Western United States. We brought lawns with us when we moved from the from England to the Eastern United States and then from the first colonies out to the Western United States. But we're living in a climate in the Western United States where lawns no longer make sense. A very substantial fraction of our outdoor, of our water use in homes is outdoor water use for lawns. Uh, that's, you know, some maybe they're nice. I, I don't actually like them, but but it's an unnecessary demand for water that we could address as part of our reforming the system. Back to demand, back to supply for a second. You know, there have been some suggestions that, well, hey, let's do more of what we've always done in the 20th century. Let's find another source of water and bring it out west. Let's find water in the Mississippi River, which of course sometimes floods and is a huge river. And let's pump it over the Rocky Mountains into the Western US. That's never gonna happen economically. We're at the limits of supply, what I call peak water. We're running up against the natural limits of what's available to us. You know, technically we could bring water from the Mississippi River, but but economically, environmentally, and politically, that's not going to happen. It's it's a literally and figuratively a pipe dream. And yet I, I am an optimist in the long run. It's it's permitted me to continue to work in this area for 40 years to, to address water issues and climate issues. I do see a growing awareness that climate change is a real problem and that we have to deal with it. And, you know, we're, we're decades behind the ball on that, but we're moving in the right direction and there are options and solutions to that. Uh, and I'm encouraged by that, despite the fact that we're already seeing impacts from climate change that perhaps we could have avoided had we acted earlier. And on a, uh, from a water perspective, I'm also an optimist and I know that we can do things faster. There are political barriers, there are educational barriers and informational barriers, there are economic barriers and ideological barriers. There's, there are barriers that need to be overcome. But I'm optimistic in the sense that I know that the solutions are out there to our water problems. And I know that people are implementing them in some places it's already. The challenge is going to be accelerating those efforts. Thank <music> you.